Thank you, Cal. Good morning, everyone. Welcome today. It's great to be with you for worship this morning. We're going to sing songs this morning that are going to talk about the things that we know, the things that we stand firm on, that we have confidence in. Uh, the very first hymn that we sing comes right out of 2 Timothy chapter 1 where it says, But I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. If it's, you look in your NIV, it's a little different, but that's right out of the Bible. So as we sing these songs, let's use them as an encouragement to remind us about the things that we're we're confident in, and then sometimes there might be some words that make us wonder how much we know about our faith, how deep. So let's use those as encouragements to check out and dig deeper into God's Word to stand firm on the things we profess. Would you please stand with us? We're going to open with hymn number 527. Welcome somebody who's new. You try to find somebody you haven't spoken to recently, and then we'll sing some more. will reign forever and all the world will know his name everyone together sing the song of the redeemer i know that my redeemer lives and now i stand on one he is my savior You are the only way, I say go, I say go. The King has come from heaven, and all the symbols of His name, victory forever. He's the song of the Redeemer. I know the fiery. Savior, 
Lord God, we stand firm on your promises, on your word that is truth. Build our faith today as we worship you in these songs. We sing, My Savior Lives. My Savior Lives. My Savior Lives. My Savior Lives. Let's worship with that. My Savior Lives. My Savior Lives. My Savior Lives. I know. I know that my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did, my Savior, my Savior. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, You are the only way, my Savior, my Savior. I know that my Redeemer lives. Now I stand on my feet, my Savior, my Savior. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, you are the only way, my Savior, my Savior. the Lord your thanks this morning. Father God, we are thankful. We're grateful that you pour out your love unto us. We're grateful that the love that you have, you're willing to share with all, Lord, and you're going to use us as your vessels to preach and to share that love. I pray that you would fill us with your spirit today to do those words, to say those words, to speak the things that you would want us to speak, to encourage others. And that the, the love that you've poured into us would overflow to those who need it, Lord. The very same love that your son shared and gave on the cross. We give you praise for that today. You choose the humble and raise them high. You choose the weak and make them strong you heal our brokenness inside and give us life the same love that sets the captives free the same love that open eyes to see is calling us all by name you are calling us all by name the same And speak the words, you are mine. You call the sin and the proud. Come to me now. Same love that sets the captives free. Same love that opens eyes to see is calling us all by name. You are calling us all by name.
And Father, we know that you are calling us in the name of Jesus Christ. You are calling us in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you are calling us to be vessels of your eternal glory. And so, Father, your people are here. Show us Christ. Fill us with your Spirit. And have us be vessels of your glory to the praise of your name. And all God's people say, Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You may be seated. So often we want to see a work of the Holy Spirit. We want to see, we want to know that the Holy Spirit is tangible, evident, and working in a place. And so this morning I'm saying to you that I'm going to show you a work of the Holy Spirit. If you were in the first service, you would have seen baptisms, confessions of faith, transfers of memberships. All of those things are an evident work of the Holy Spirit. Nobody calls on the name of Jesus Christ without the Spirit first working in their life. And so this morning, the second service, we get to join what happened in the first. And you get to see a tangible work of the Spirit. And so in two ways, we're going to have con confession of faith in one sense with a membership transfer and the celebration of infant baptism. So first, I want to welcome up Dave and Gloria Deckinga. And they're going to join us by way of transfer of membership. And Dave and Gloria will join Pastor Mike up here. And our elder, Mr. Gortzma. Mr. Gortzma. And as they come up here to join us, why are they here this morning? Why are they here to say, we want to be members of this church? Many of you are members of Costco. You like the $1.50 hot dog, don't you? That, that's why you go there, right? You go to Costco for what you can get, the benefits, the value. Why would you want a covenant with the church? Why would you want to stand up here with bright lights on and say, I, I want a membership with you? Because Christians, we believe the Holy Spirit is at work in his church, and he is calling people to Jesus Christ, and he gives us gifts to partner together to build up the kingdom of God. And so there is no better decision you can ever make than to follow Jesus and partner with his bride, the church. And so this morning, you get to see a work of the Holy Spirit where two folks come to say, we want to partner with you, and we want to partner with God for what the Spirit is doing. So, Dave, Gloria, thank you for joining us. Do you, on this day, reaffirm, do you covenant with these people and before your God to continue to walk in the faith of Jesus Christ, to continue to be vessels of his glory, to continue to be vessels of the presence of the Holy Spirit, gifted by the Spirit, to build this place up and to bless the nations with the truth and person of Jesus Christ. On this day, do you too covenant to that work? God bless you guys. Let's join you in a time of prayer as we celebrate what God has done in and through your lives. And so, Father, we are here because of Jesus. We are here because of the Holy Spirit working in our brother and sister's life. And so, Father, we thank you that they are partnering with us, but more importantly, they're partnering with the global church to use their gifts of the Spirit to bring the gospel to those here and to the nations. Father, may we bless them well, and may they bless us well, as all of us covenant together for the glory of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray, and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Welcome, guys. Would you please welcome them to Fellowship Reformed Church. Also going to welcome up Derek and Amanda, Tom and Mary for the baptism celebration of their children. And so as they come up, we are reminded uh, in the Reformed faith that we baptize infants. We do not baptize them out of tradition, although our traditions and practices are dear to us. We do not baptize these precious children out of sentiment, although they are precious and they are beautiful. But that's not reason for a baptism. We don't baptize to salvation because salvation is repentance and trust in Jesus Christ. So why do we baptize these precious infants this morning? Because their parents have expressed faith in Jesus Christ and therefore these children are in the covenant of faith under their parents. 
And so we set them aside this morning through baptism to acknowledge they are in that covenant looking forward to the day that they acknowledge Jesus as Lord and Savior, repenting and trusting in Him, and following Him as their Lord and Savior. So on this morning, we get to acknowledge you as parents. And I get the joy of asking you some questions about your faith. And so for Derek and Amanda, Tom and Mary, let me ask you three questions and with one response. Do you re-acknowledge today your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Do you re-acknowledge today before all of these folks that your children, well precious, are born in sin? And that apart from Jesus Christ that they are lost? Do you covenant on this morning again to raise these children in the love of Christ, in the knowledge of Christ, in the community of Christ? using all your gifts, all your talents, and all the resources that God has given you to point these precious children to Jesus. Derek and Amanda, what is your answer? And Tom and Mary, what is your answer? God bless you guys. I get the privilege of walking Vivian Joy, introducing her to the congregation. And so I get that joy right now. Oh, sweetie. Hi, honey. Those eyes are too big. Friends, this is Vivian Joy. Vivian means joyous spirit. And joy means? Good job. Joy. (laughs) Vivian Joy. Now, as we look out at her, she's precious. But again, this is so much more than a precious moment. This is a covenant inclusion in faith. And so, family, this is little Vivian Joy. Hi. This is Cohen Thomas. The word Cohen or the name Cohen means the generous one. We're going to talk about that this morning as one of the gifts, the generous one. And Thomas, well, it's famous would be doubting Thomas. That's not what we're going to do here. Thomas means the blessed one. When he was asked, Lord, we don't know the way, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And when that name came to Thomas, he was blessed and showed that way to others. Congregation, would you please stand? Jeremy asked a lot of words, uh, starting with the word covenant. It's a solemn promise. Church, do you covenant? When you're able to teach these children, to show them the way of salvation, to demonstrate to them the lifestyle of Jesus Christ, would you pray for them, teaching them how to pray when you have opportunity? Will you do this? If you will, please say, we will. Amen. Thank you. We'll have little Cohen Thomas come over here first. Cohen Thomas Zielstra, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Vivian... Joy Gorder, child of the covenant, baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let's join in a time of prayer. And so, Father, we have signified in the washing of water our need to be cleansed in Jesus Christ. We thank you for a covenant faith that extends to our children. Now, Father, we pray through this body and through these families that we would train up these children to know Jesus and love Jesus and to be used boldly for Jesus in this world. Father, we commit them to Christ. and We pray that they would be guided by your Holy Spirit every day of their lives. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. After the service, you're going to get the opportunity to greet all of them at the door. They're going to have all their children with them. It's going to be chaos. Go talk to them for a really long time. Just hang out around them. Really test their parenting skills after the service, okay? With our new members as well, make sure you get a chance. Introduce yourself. Say hi. Welcome them to this covenant of faith. 
You'll notice around this morning, a lot in the first service, we'll see who's here in the second service, some folks with some brown t-shirts on. If you are serving at VBS in any way whatsoever, even if you're not wearing your shirt, don't care, please stand up if you are volunteering in any capacity at VBS this week. Where are you at? There we go. It does take an army. First service was very impressive. Yeah, wow, I didn't even get that. Here's what we're gonna do. You are not just volunteering to hand out snacks and play games, although you will do that. You are volunteering what? To tangibly bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to these children, to bless them in word and in deed. And so that is a spiritual task. So we want to pray over every one of you this morning. So if you are sitting near one of these folks, I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm going to ask you to place your hands on them. Yes, this is a church. It's what we do. We pray. And so you're going to place your hands on them. And we are going to ask the Spirit of God to use them as vessels of glory for Jesus Christ this week. So find someone standing, and let's join in agreement in prayer. And so, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, VBS is fun, and it is a great time to focus on these children. But, Father, we acknowledge that first, this is a spiritual reality. And so, Father, our aim beyond having fun is that the hearts of these children would be turned to Christ, and that many of these hearts would continue to grow in Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we are asking for every person volunteering this week that they would be filled with the presence and knowledge of your Holy Spirit, that they would be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, that they would have the words of life to speak, that they could display the gospel in tangible ways through how they act and live, and that many, that all, would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And so, Father, that is a work of your Holy Spirit. We pray this blessing now on these folks as they prepare to serve. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, thank you for your service. A couple other things we want to draw your attention to. The yellow insert is always before you with updates for this week on health, sickness, and general transitions in life for members of this church. Let's take some time with our hearts in our minds as one body to come before the throne of God's grace in prayer. Let's pray. So, Father, we don't take this moment lightly. We believe that we are in your presence, that by your Holy Spirit you have drawn us to your side, that we are before your throne of grace, and while we cannot see you, we are with you. And we are not with you as enemies or in our sin. But we are with you as your children, as your sons and daughters who are loved. And so, Father, because of your Holy Spirit's work, we come to you in prayer. Father, we do pray for those who have requested prayer this week, for Bob Van Austin, Rhonda Miller, Diane Phillips. Father, again, the power and presence of the Spirit, we pray, in their lives this week as they recover. Father, for Jordan Miedema, as he's on his way to Africa today, he's, he's gone. Father, his prayer was so clear before he left. Yes, pray for safety. Yes, pray that I would see the world. But if you're going to pray for one thing, you need to pray that I would be a vessel of glory to God, that he would pour me out and use me in eternal ways. Father, that is the very heart we want of everyone in this place, that our lives would be dispendable for your purposes because there is no better place to be for Paula Hanges, Jake Ellis, Al Frankfurt, again, Father, roads of recovery that need to happen. Father, raise up people to walk with them on this road. For Chad and little Van Ree, Father, we thank you that both of those reports have come back so well. And for Hannah as well, a good report, another visit, things are progressing. For Keith and Jan, again, they, they mourn the loss of family, and yet they celebrate in the unswerving hope of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you again for Synod that's meeting right now. Our delegate, John Nott, is here, and yet he returns tonight to continue the work of the church, Father. Again, we pray that Scripture would be the very meditation of our heart. It would be the very rule for how we make decisions, and that through our service as a body, a church, a denomination, that we would honor you in all things. Father, the word this morning is evident. The Word is central, and the Word is going to be walked through line by line. And so, Father, we know that every word in your Scripture is inspired, inerrant, infallible. It's perfect for life. 
And so, Father, we thank you that Pastor Mike will walk us through your word this morning. But we need your spirit. And so we pray a blessing of your spirit upon him as he teaches. We pray a blessing of the Holy Spirit upon us as we receive. That you would remove our doubts. That you would remove what distracts us. And you would have us to come to your word and by your spirit be filled with its wisdom and truth. And so, Father, we pray that not only this day, but that every day of our lives would be an overflow of worship to you. So, Father, from how we sing to how we give to how we live, may it all be a continuous song of praise to your beautiful name. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So friends, our deacons are coming forward for the time of morning offering where we generously give back because Christ first generously gave to us. We're also going to continue in a time of worship with the passing of the fellowship pad. It's a great way for us to follow up with you. If you're a visitor, we'd love to contact you. And also for regular members, it helps us know that you're here and we can talk with you on an ongoing basis. Let's continue now in song. Please thank the praise team for their role in this worship service. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated, and as you are seated, I ask you to get a couple things. Number one, a pen. <laughs> oh, Mike, I don't like to write. I'm just asking you to do that because when you write it down, it makes you feel you've put something on it and made a little bit more of a commitment. Number two, in the bullet, and there should be an outline for each person. If you do not have one, we probably have some extra bulletins you can go the outline will be up on the screen, we hope. I do the best job I can. Yep, there it is. <laughs> the third thing, most important, Romans chapter 12. Would you please go there uh, in your iPad 
in the Pew Bible and the Bible you brought from home, Romans chapter 12. And I'm going to ask you to keep that open. We are going to walk through it the whole time. I will also be in, in uh, Ephesians 2 and uh, in 1 Corinthians 12. You don't have to go there, but if you're really good with the Word of God, maybe you can. That's Ephesians 2 and 1 Corinthians 12. Maybe throw something in there. I'll give you time. Romans 12 to begin with. As always, we're going to bathe this sermon in prayer, please. Lord, two things. I pray that you would help me to do the best I can to expound on the words that you helped me to write throughout the week. And in relation to that, I pray, dear God, that if I have not listened well to your spirit and I say anything from this pulpit that is not according to your most holy word, that these people, whether they're hearing it online, whether they're hearing it here, it doesn't matter. May they forget it. But if I have listened, I have prayed, I have written as you want me to and expound it the way you want to, it would take root in our hearing, in our mind, in our hearts. And today this is really going to mean something. It would transform our lives. Heavenly Father, the second thing, now baptize each person that listens because it can only come into their hearts and minds if you open their ears and hearts. Speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll begin to write in a few minutes. I have the privilege, and I don't use that word lightly, I have the privilege this morning of being up here between two very significant events. Number one, last week, Pastor Sean stood, even though he had a chair over there, he never sat on it, it's not his nature. He stood in front of a chair because for years when I was a lead pastor here, I did what I called a sit-down sermon. I did what we called the talk. You see, for 38 years, I was the one who would sit before a congregation and share and even set direction sometime for that church. For 38 years, I did what Pastor Sean got to do last week. So I no longer set direction. I now have the privilege of helping to fulfill that direction. He shared dreams. He shared challenges. If you haven't heard it, please get the, get the recording. He unveiled happenings that were a long time behind the scene and now are coming to pass. What a joy it was for me to play a small part in those dreams and those challenges. I'll get back to all that in about 10 minutes. Number two, the other significant event. And I also stand on this pulpit area, excuse me, with the VBS set all behind you. Just look at this stuff. This is one of the challenges that Sean mentioned. And we'll get back to that one in about 10 minutes as well. So with this week, like last week, and VBS in front of us, I ask for this thing. I have been led very clearly to a passage of Scripture. I think it's a fairly familiar passage of Scripture that clearly helps us understand our Christian responsibilities. Open God's Word, and we're going to go to, again, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. That's how we're going to creep through this passage. Here we go. Therefore, and I'm going to emphasize words as I read, I urge you, I beg you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, that's going to be the first point, your bodies as living sacrifices how holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. What kind of his will? His good will, his pleasing will, and his perfect will. Here we go with some of your outline. First of all, Christianity must be seen, but Christianity may not just, Christianity is not just on the inside. Now, here's a, here's a truth. It, Christianity begins as, begins as a belief. Now, I want to talk about that word begins. It is essential for every person who calls themselves a Christian, to be able to say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. We just had this. We had the first service and the second service. This morning we had people stand before this church and make it clear that they believe. 
that they've come to the point in their lives when we believe in Jesus Christ. Now let me be a little bit, if we have some new people here, new people watching, that we believe that Jesus Christ was God. That we believe that Jesus Christ came to this earth to show us how to live. That he came to this earth to die for us, to take our sins upon himself and nail it to a cross. And prove that he left it in the cross and in the grave by rising from the dead and then going and preparing a place for us in heaven. That's how much of fast I'm going to go this morning. We believe. First of all, it begins with a belief. Number two. Ready? It begins inside of us. Now, you may call it your soul. Whatever place you may do, there's something inside of us where the Holy Spirit touches us for the first time. It cannot be seen. It is felt inside. Number three, it begins with a change of our mind. Look in verse two, a renewing of our minds, a change of mind. What does that mean? We begin to think differently. We think about ourselves less and all of a sudden start, start, uh, start thinking about others more. When God changes our mind through his Holy Spirit, when we believe in Jesus Christ, all of a sudden we start thinking about godly things rather than always focusing on earthly things. We are going to have our day stretched in front of us and for the first time we're beginning to ask, what does God want me to do rather than what do I want to do? You get the difference? Our minds are, are all of a sudden thinking more about being humble, more about being compassionate, more about being caring. None of that is normal for a human being. We ask when we're going to make a decision, God, is this moral? Is this ethical? Is this what you want me to do? Is this godly? Is this good? We have a change of our mind. Let's go on to a couple screens again. In Christianity, it begins with a... Write it down. A personal relationship. Now listen to the word personal. It is for you as an individual. No one can give Christ to you as much as we love our children and grandchildren or our parents who aren't Christians. We cannot put it in them. We individually need to decide whether or not we're a believer. To decide on whether or not we're going to be connected to Christ it comes to the point when we personally say, Jesus, use me. Jesus, change me. Jesus, guide me. Jesus, direct me. Your will needs to be done, not my will. I take you as my Lord and Savior. I take you personally. Number five, it also begins, now look at all in your outline, it all begins privately, often. The person said to you, maybe even your husband and wife, no one knows what's going on inside. They do not yet see what the Holy Spirit is doing. They do not yet know what direction you're doing. They can't see you changing. It's a private thing. And you may go there. I have it written in my notes. But Ephesians chapter 2 talks about this. Listen to the word of God. I love this passage. For it is by grace that you have been saved. All inside stuff. Through faith. And this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God. We'll get into that in a second. Now listen to this last line. It is not by works so that no one can boast. When it begins in you, it is not yet by works. You cannot see it. Those two verses beautifully sum up nearly all of the points we just went through. Let's go to, to the B points, the next one. Christianity becomes outward. This is going to be kind of controversial, but I hope and pray that you see where I went. When it matures. Here we go. When a person feels the Lord, believes in the Lord, lets the Holy Spirit change our minds and have a, person, a personal intimate uh, relationship with him, well, again, I'll let's private. A private commitment cannot and should not, however, stay private. Now, this is it. We just did a whole bunch of covenant stuff up here. I'm going to do this again. A private commitment to Jesus Christ cannot and should not stay private. Look at God's holy word, verse 1. Let's fill in some blanks. We become, it commands us to become living sacrifices. Living. Look down at verse 1 again. In view of God's mercy. Here's the plea. Offer your, what's the next word? Good. Some of you haven't opened the word of God yet. Offer your bodies. 
as living sacrifices. No, give me this. No, don't just offer your feelings. That's done already. Don't just offer your thoughts. That's done already. You're already a Christian. Don't just offer your minds. Don't just offer your souls. Don't just offer your hearts. We've done that. Now listen, as you mature, we begin to live our faith. It's shown now in our bodies, in our actions, and in our deeds. Number two, we will strive for holiness. Look down at verse one again. Holy and pleasing to God. We're into pleasing in the next point. Let's talk about holy. As we mature, we will want to be more like Christ. We will want to act more like Christ. We're going to want to treat other people like Christ treated them. Now you say, Mike, where in the world is it talk about being holy? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, listen to the word of God. But just as he, Christ, is holy, here's the command, so be holy in all you do. Maturing. Will we ever become fully holy? Listen to me, no. I'm going to say it again. Will we all become fully holy? Holy, no, but it must be our daily goal to be more like Christ, more holy every day. Lord, help me to be more like you. Number three, we will desire to, there's the word, please God. Again, verse one, holy and pleasing to God. Let me give you a picture. Let me do an illustration rather than just talk. My dad, when I was young, was not like me. He was not talkative and demonstrative like I am. Um, when I was a young man, he didn't do a whole bunch of compliment. He didn't run on the field and give me a big hug. He would sit in the stands, and if I would do something that was pretty good, here's Glenn. <laughs> there it is. I'm jumping up and down when one of my grandkids get a hit. I'm going nuts. Here's Glenn. You say, big deal. It is a big deal. It felt so good to please my earthly father. People of God, do we feel that way when we please our Heavenly Father? A mature Christian wants to please his or her Heavenly Father, number four. As we mature, we no longer conform, instead we transform. Still the Bible open, look at verse two to make sure I'm in the Word of God. Before Christ, we want to please people. We want to please our friends. We want to please our schoolmates. We want to please our workmates. We come to our parents and we say inside of ourselves, everybody's doing it, as an excuse that that's we should do it too. But as we mature, we don't want to just fit in with people anymore. After Christ, we want to say, no, wait a minute. How do I please him? I want to be loved by and liked by Christ. I want to be changed by Christ. In fact, I want to transform our society to be more like Christ. I want to transform my life. I want to transform my family's life, my friend's life, and yes, the society's life. Let's get into some more. We're going quickly because it's that rich. We desire to, as we mature, to do God's will. You see, it matters less what others want us to do. It matters everything what God wants us to do. And here's that word again, to do. No, not just to believe, not just to think, not just to feel. We've gone past that. Now what we believe comes out. If you don't believe me, I'm back in Ephesians chapter 2. Now understand that Ephesians 2 is a great reformed, you're in a reformed church, thing of you are saved by grace, not by works. That's how you're saved. And the paragraph ends there, right? It does not end there. Ephesians 2.10, listen to this. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's maturity, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's as far as we're going to that. That ought to challenge a lot of our theologies this morning according to God's word, and that was Ephesians chapter 2. Let's go to the next part. This I like. Christians must be separate and yet inseparable. Where do you get that one, Michael? Verses 3 through 5, this is the word of God. Read it with me, Romans 12. For by the grace given me, I say to everyone, I'm going to stop there, 
what he's going to do from here on is not talking to a tiny group. It is talking to every one of us. Now, don't look at your husband. He needs to hear this. Don't look at your wife. She needs to hear this. Don't look at your kids. Everyone, start over, and I'll stop at living. For by the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober, proper uh, judgment. In accordance with the measure of faith, God has given you, verse 4, just as each, each, each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, and I'll get to the word function soon. It'll be a word you write in, verse 5. So in Christ, we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Well, this is just really good stuff. Let's do some things. Let's talk about what it means to be separate within the church. What that means is this. God chooses our, your level of faith. That's verse 3. Look at it. This is not, Christianity is not a democracy. I know we all love democracies because we all want to say, John, I don't know where you are. John just, he came all the way back from General Senate from Chicago, our representative, he's here. And in that assembly, they're going to vote on stuff. Hi. Now, isn't that nice that we all vote on stuff? I don't know how to say this. You can get a million people in a room and they all vote one way, but if God's word says it the other, this is not a democracy, it is a dictatorship. Because dictator is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and he knows what is best for us. He knows what is best for his church. He knows what is best for his kingdom. He chose, chooses what level, what portion, the kind of faith to give to each one of us. Let's go on. God chooses our, there's the word I said when I was reading, our function in the body. Now, by body, I'm going to stop here. Some of you maybe are brand new Christians and you say, what are you talking about this body? The body literally means the church. What is the church? If God is our creator, if the church is, is he is the church's master, he knows what the church needs and who needs to do it. Our job is not to tell God what we want from him. You say a prayer. Uh, Jesus, this is what I want to do with my life. God, this is what I want to do. Would you please give me those gifts that I can do this? That's not what he does. God places into you what he wants you to do, so our prayer must be this. God, would you show me what you want me to do? He chooses our function in the body. So we're all different. We all have different gifts. That's the separateness. Now let's go into the inseparable. Here we go. Inseparable. We have, there is one, you know what word I'm going to put in there. There is one body, verse 4, one church. Now, we're not talking about a building. This is a church, but it's not the church. When we're talking about churches, every person in the world who has confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior is a member of the church. And we believe there is one Savior, and everyone who acknowledges him is a member of that church. There is one body. Next one. We all belong to each other and to God. Look at verse 5. So make sure I'm in God's word. It must be, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. It may be changed soon. I'm not the lead pastor anymore. But, but for nearly 17 years, fellowship's theme has been a place to holy cow, you do know it. <laughs> Sometimes you can have a theme and nobody knows what it is. Place to belong. No. Yes, I presented that theme to the consistory in 1998, and they adopted it, and, and all based on, and I based it on this very verse. We belong. We belong to Jesus Christ. We belong to God the, God the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, and we belong to each other. We are inseparable. Now, I just want you to sit there and listen to the Word of God as I read it, because this is needs no explanation. This is 1 Corinthians 12. Feel this wonderful scriptural illustration. The body is a unit. Though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body, separate, inseparable. So it is with Christ. 
For we are all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Inseparable, separate. More verses, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are, of, are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unre- uh, unpresentable, and there are unpresentable parts, are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has. Now here we're back to this again. We don't choose. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lack it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. Two more verses. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now, the second word here is right in your face. Now you. Don't look past this. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. No explanation. I'm not going to do any more than that. That was 1 Corinthians 12. Read the whole thing. Let's go to the last points. Our third section. Christians are to use their spiritual skills. Let's do some of this. I'm going to do some examples. I'm not going to go off the page. I'm going to walk us through very quickly some of the skills, some of the gifts that are listed here, and I'm going to call them the what. What are they? Let's do the first one. Ready to write? Now, don't just write for the fun of it, because I'm going to have you do something at the end. Prophecy. What is prophecy? Prophecy is not to just foretell, but to (laughs) forthtell. Now, get this. Prophecy may involve telling the future once in a while, to be able to predict what's going to happen, but it's a byproduct of the forthtelling. Now, what's forthtelling mean? Forthtelling is this. By forthtelling, I mean telling what the Word of God says and means. If we are able to see the Word of God, tell what it means, and say, if we continue to go down this path, this might happen. So in our forthtelling, sometimes we have foretelling. Prophecy is the ability to see what the Word of God says and see the path that we're on. This is how fast we're going to go. Next, next again, skill or gift is the gift of service. Here's how I'm defining it. What can I do for you? People with this gift want to serve cookies at VBS. (laughs) People with this gift want to help clean up and set up for VBS and other things. I just have this beautiful thing behind me. They bring meals to people they want to. These people of service, they give rides, they stock shelves, they feel called to work in a food pantry to serve. These people go outside and do the landscaping. I mean, you just walk past this stuff. You should see all the people that do that. They serve at weddings, they serve at funerals, they serve at gatherings, they serve at celebrations like our 50th coming up. They build this set and everything that you saw in the lobby. They go to Mel Trotter. They go to Love in the Name of Christ. They go and build things with Tool Time Ministry. They, (gasps) that's enough. Service. How you doing? Next couple. Teach. Teach means to inform, and it means to instruct. Now, here we go. Teaching is a lot like prophecy. They're able to look into the Word of God and teach it to another, except prophecy kind of has a thing like preaching where you do it to a great big crowd or a bigger group, whereas teaching is much more intimate. It may be a Sunday school class or a Wednesday night class or a discipleship class or a, a, a group within your home where you read the Word of God and you talk about it and one person leads the teacher as he or she informs and instructs. Teaching, another gift. Another, number four, encouragement. Here we go, write these, please, because each one is different. It means to build up another person. It means to lift up another person. It means to pick up another person. Let me describe an encourager. These people will go to the hurting. 
They'll go to the hungry. They'll go to the tired. They'll go to the weak. They'll go to the poor. They'll go to the grieving. They'll go to the depressed. And they will walk in there and lift them up. They will, here's the word, edify them. That's a great scriptural word. They come up to a person, and you've all watched motivation as you're trying to teach kids, and one, an encouraging parent, will say, now, now Johnny, you can do this. You, no, 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 honey, you can do this. A discouraging parent said, that was awful. You can't do that. Do you see the difference? One tries to build them up. How are you doing? Let's do another one. Another encourager tries to put smiles on faces rather than frowns or tears. They lift them up. They oftentimes mix encouragement with service and helping people get back on their feet and closer to God. See, they can mix those two, encouragement and service, and they actually go out there and pick them up. They tell others what is right in their life rather than constantly telling what is wrong. Are you an encourager? Let's go with a couple more. Here we go. Contribution. And we're not going to go around this. This one sometimes, here we got all these lists, and all of a sudden they leave this one out. I don't get it. Here we go. It means to give money, to fund the services. Now, again, let me do this. Some of you are service people or teachers or mission, doing mission trips. You do the food distribution. You can build all this. You can repair. And there's other people who give you the money to be able to buy this and do it. They give the gift of contribution. God has gifted some people to make a lot of money and then have the wonderful ability to just desire to give it away. They pay the bills, a lot of the bills. All people are called to tithe. I want to do that again. Every person in here. You say, I'll leave it up to the rich people. That is not what the Word of God says. All of us are called to tithe. It's simply that some people can tithe and do far much more because they have the gift of contribution. Number six, the gift of leadership. What is a leader? It's a person who sees the way, who shows the way, and who leads the way. They form direction of a church, of a ministry, of a mission, of a project. Some people have this ability. They have the ability to see where they are, to know the goals of where they're going and then chart a way to get there. They see a vision. They cast a vision. They show how step by step the vision can happen. And this is what's needed. The best leaders do the vision with the people. Now, a leader can say, uh, go over there. Uh, do that. No, that's okay. But the leader of Jesus Christ didn't say, do that, do that. He said, follow me. You got the difference? A true leader says, I will lead the way. Follow me. Two more, I think. Number one, it's right after leadership. I want to put the two different. I, I want to talk about governance. What it means to administrate. Now, look at this because that may be some of you. To plan and to organize. <laughs> okay, I'm going to laugh here. There are people that you've always been around. They got the greatest ideas in the world and said, how are you going to do that? I don't know. I mean, this is the greatest idea ever heard. How are you going to do that? I don't know. You know what they need? They need an administrator. Let me get into this. Some rare leaders have both. They can both lead and administrate. But usually a leader needs an administration to do, administrator to do a detailed work. A leader sets direction for a mission trip. Uh, an administrator invents or plans all the steps on the way. <laughs> A leader raises money, an administrator mm, positively and properly distributes the money. A leader sees the project almost done before it starts. The administrator gets it done from the start. <laughs> Let's get her over one more. Beautiful gift, the gift of mercy. It means to help. It means to care. And it means to, I'll get there, to love one another. Uh, let me substitute a word for mercy just for a moment, is the word compassion. Because I looked it up, and all through God's word, as they followed Jesus along, he would come and see a group of people, and it says he had compassion on them. Like sheep without a shepherd, he had compassion on them. And when that compassion is not earned or deserved, but given instead, it means it is mercy. Now, 
I like to talk to people that work at missions, like I'll just mention, because I mentioned Mel Trotter. They go there, and there are people that are just destitute. And they sit with them, and they know how they got there. And how they got there was probably a lot of times their fault. And we can say, that's their fault. I, I can't help it. No, wait a minute. Mercy is when you say, I see how you got here, and yes, you made some mistakes, but I still love you, Christ still loves you, and I want to help you get out of here. Some of you have that wonderful, forgiving gift of mercy. How you doing? All right. Now, in a rare thing, what he does in this passage is he adds some adverbs. Yes, I'm going to be an English teacher a little bit. Let's do some of these things. First of all, an adverb is how something is to be done. Uh, look at Scripture passage again. I just want you to look at all the gifts I just mentioned. Just look at it in Scripture. And at every single one of those gifts, if it is this, let him. If it is this, let him. What it says is, you need to do this. Don't walk out of here and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know, know what one of my gifts are. And Jesus is going to look at you and say, no, 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 no. Do the gift. No. How do you do it? Let's do some words that he uses. First of all, verse 8, look down. We are to give generously. Now, this is naughty because it's money, so you can throw things at me later, but... Don't give as little as you can. If you walk here and every time you see that, uh, that offering plate or the church asks you for money and you say, let's see once, I wonder what's the littlest amount I can give and still not feel guilty. <laughs> That's not a Christian response. The Christian response is, how much should I give in relationship to this? Lord, help me be generous. I'll just give you a couple things. If you look in the bulletin today, guests, you can just humor you, but you don't have to look at our... We are so close to knocking out this debt. And Sean, I thought, was really too nice last week, so I'm going to be naughty. Hey, come on now. This thing is piddling. We, we knock out the debt. Listen to me. Next week, debt done. De a deal? Deal? If even of any of you would give generously, done. Underneath is also a thing that we're like uh, 70 some thousand dollars behind. Really, our budget is set up at $42 per week per family. $42. That means if everybody would tithe, they would bring home a whole family, $420 a week. <laughs> Not going to happen. All right. If we give generously, let's catch up on this budget so that we can give generously to others. That's as much generously. And that was fun. Uh, <laughs> uh, next one. And we are to lead diligently. That means leaders, elders, deacons, pastors, Sunday school teachers, Lead seriously. Lead with purpose. Lead with determination. Lead with focus. Lead without stepping off God's path. John, when you go back in the general center, wouldn't it be nice if we could lead from the word of God and not do it? That's what he means by diligently, seriously. We have one more word because I'm going too long. And also, when you give mercy, do it with a smile on your face and a smile in your heart. This is not a Christian phrase, a, a Christian phrase, because your children do it. Uh, honey, would you go clean your bedroom? Do I? Oh, you got kids like that too. Do I have to? You want to apply your size 12 right about where they sit down when they do that too many times. That's how God feels. When he gives all these gifts to Mike Van Buren, and I look at him and go, do I have to? Michael, I have given you this much and you're asking me. No, no, no. Do it cheerfully. Ooh. Don't you wish there were no adverbs in Scripture? We are almost finished, and this is where I'm going to ask you to get a little bit serious for a minute. Got pen in hand, you got a blank, use your next door neighbors if you have to, but this is kind of a signing a contract. I believe after listening to this that my gift or gifts is, I'm going to give you 30 seconds, write it down. Look at those gifts. Some of you have all eight of them. Some of you have one. All of you have at least one. I believe my gift is. 
This is one of the nastiest and most honest times of this sermon. <laughs> you have to circle either have or have not. I have not been using this for Christ. I have been using this for Christ. How are we doing? Simple circle of honesty. Next one. I can use it for, I have this gift in the church, in the area, in society, at school, around. I can use my gift to do this. Write it down. What is it? What, what can I use my gift to do? I can use my gift for this. I've not been doing it, Lord. I, I, I want to. You've inspired me with your word this morning. I can do it for this. Why are we doing this? We've come full circle to the first verse of Romans 12. Because these things are our spiritual acts of worship. This is not to just bring in notoriety to yourself. This is an act of worship. With those things written, fold them up, put them in your pocket, pray with me. Lord, for the people that did not have a piece of paper and did not write anything down, their mind was going. You spoke to them through your Holy Spirit. And whether from this church or a visitor, visitor from another church, wherever we are, I pray that we would go to our place of worship. We would look at that church and say, where can I use my church, my, my gifts, generously? Where can I use my gifts cheerfully? Where can I use my gifts diligently? Dear God, show us, gift us, use us, inspire us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're able, would you please stand for God's parting blessing? There's a big world out there with not nearly enough harvesters, not nearly enough those who go and use their gifts. People of God, discover your gifts. Use them for him and change the world around you. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and stay with us all forever. Lost our Savior, find their way at the sound of your great name. All condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb. Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up, and all the world will praise your name. All the Fatherless, they find their rest at the sound of your great name. The sick are healed and the dead are raised at the sound.
You are high and lifted up. All the world. 